but you have to learn a little bit, of course. But the playing with it is quite nice. Because my last lecture is about retina check, and that makes all the applications on how to find the vessels and the micro breathing sensor operational. So that's, that's a very medical application. So you can choose my lecture or your lecture. Yeah? Lecture. I was the lecture. Okay, there's more. Then I, I continue with my lecture. And, um, as I said, I, if there are interruptions, you would like to have some, ask some questions, so please, please, please do. I, I like it. So when I talk about this practical uh, image analysis, uh, it's called brain inspired. And now you understand why it's brain inspired. I'm going to use all these tricks that we saw before. Both the orientation and phobia, the color, you name it. I have one question. Why a deaf person that is speaking in sign languages cannot read? That's a too difficult question, I don't know. <coughs> but I know that deep learning systems can learn everything. And you have very good deep learning systems that do gesture recognition. So they know how to learn that language. Because you train them with patterns, and you can train deep learning systems with any pattern. With images, with uh, motions, uh, so it, 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 it's actually quite nice. This slide is a little bit where I come from. Very nice view to show. I come from Eindhoven. And Eindhoven is the high tech city from the Netherlands. It's quite famous. We have Philips. We have a company like ASML. And all of them have a campus. So we have the university campus. We have the Philips campus. Big company. They make MRI CT scan. We have a research campus called High Tech Campus, and we have a campus from ASML. So we have a, a little bit of, I have the fortune that I live in a quite special system. That's, that's quite extraordinary. Um, it was, this is actually what I'd like to talk about, medical image computing. We do uh, image enhancement, visualization, simulation, modeling, segmentation, registration. And everything today is now done also with deep learning. So that's quite special. I talked about the general pipelines before. Uh, this is the, uh, the MRI technique. <coughs> Have you ever seen a, 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 a CT scanner? This is a CT scan, how it moves. And this rotates three times per second. And it does have not one detector banana. But it has 750 detector bananas. So in one rotation, it made six, uh, 750 slices per second. So that is pretty amazing. So the patient goes through, and in yeah, just 20 seconds, you scan the patient from top to bottom. So the amount of data that's coming out of these scanners today is just amazing. And people normally look at, let's say, 6,000 uh, slices from the lung. So which doctor is still going to look at 6,000 slices and one by one search where it was the tumor? So that's not all done by automation, by you have computer-aided diagnosis and, and the system says, hey doctor, look at slice 1371. And then the doctor looks at, oh yeah, that, there it is. So that's uh, really needed because of the incredible overflow of data. We have now MRI. And with MRI, maybe you know that, there are 24 different MRI techniques. And with every MRI technique, you can measure something different in physics. So with MRI, you can measure not only the hydrogen uh, in an image, how much is there. You can see uh, what is the pH, so how acid is it. You can measure the local amount of oxygen. You can measure the velocity. <laughs> It's amazing what you can measure. So you can measure much more from tissue than just how much hydrogen is there. This is measuring the velocity. So on every pixel we have a vector in 3D. And the big problem was how can you visualize that? So in my team, my staff member was Anna Villanova, and she was specialized. I hired her just for the visualization. She managed to uh, show 3D flow. And here you see what she does. 
At which point we had the starting, and for the first time, this is the aorta, we could show that the flow was in turbulence. And she did some nice things. Uh, if the particles went faster, you make them lighter, you give them a tail, and they become ellipsoids. So you really have a perceptual increase that you really see, yeah, they go fast. It's like in a cartoon. So we had a lot of uh, very nice work uh, in my group. And this was done by a 4D MRI, so X, Y, Z time, in four dimensions. Uh, we did measurements on uh, breast cancer detection, uh, lung cancer detection, and all done now with these uh, neural networks, because you train them with all these X-rays, CT scans, or MRI scans. And I could talk a specific uh, series of images, and that's retinal images. And these are pictures of the retina at pretty high resolution, because you make them with a regular camera, and these images are 12 megapixels. So 2,000 by 3,000, and that's far more than an uh, MRI image. So we have, MRI is 500 micron resolution, half a millimeter. That's not so good. That's the best one that I can do. But this is 50 microns, so we can see far more, uh, far better. And today we even have microscopes. Uh, the lens of the eye is pretty bad. So, but you can correct for the uh, errors in the lens. And today we can look for adaptive optics, a spectacular technique. That, that's another lecture I, I could give at no time. But then you can look at less than one micron resolution in the retina because you correct for this uh, errors in the lens by a deformable mirror. The astronomers do it. If they look to the stars, they have to correct for the atmosphere, and they borrow that technique. And instead of looking through a uh, wavy atmosphere, they look through a wavy lens, and they can see now sharp inside. But I talk about diabetes. And we know diabetes is uh, exploding. Um, and with diabetes, your blood vessels begin to leak everywhere. And that's the problem. You have leakage in your feet, in your lungs, in your uh, heart, in your brain. Uh, some people know about the diabetic foot. Uh, you have amputations in the foot. Or why in the foot? Because the pressure of the blood is, of course, highest in the foot. So if you have leakage, it leaks most there. Uh, that's 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 uh, you, you, yeah. You have to lay uh, horizontal all day. But there is no cure for diabetes. So all this bleeding and leakage goes on, and you cannot put everyone in an MRI scan to look at these vessels. So you look for a cheap way, and you look directly at the blood vessels in the retina with very high resolution. And the special thing is that these are not normal blood vessels. But these are brain blood vessels, and they're completely different from normal blood vessels. The brain is extremely protected. You cannot get medicine inside the brain, because brain vessels have a blood-brain barrier. The, the cells of the wall are much tighter than in normal vessels. Normal vessels, they can leave the sugar in and out and the food and so on. But in the brain, it's extremely protected. So if you want to get something in the brain, you have to add your medicine to very tiny molecules so that they can pass. So we look directly at the brain. And this means that this picture of the retina is today also measured for, can we study neurodegenerative diseases? So can we study Parkinson? Can we study Alzheimer? These are all brain diseases. <coughs> and they're very tiny changes in the vessels. And we are now capable of seeing changes so early that we even see the changes before the people know they have diabetes. And that's exactly what we want. Because if you wait too long, then you get damage. And all these areas where you have bleedings, they become like this. And if you go to the doctor, you say, hey, I have black spots. The doctor will say, oh my goodness, you're far too late. Because neurons do not repair. Skin is repairing, but neurons do not. So if you have these black fields, you have them forever. So you should prevent them. You, you should, as soon as possible, stop that. And there's no way to stop. Uh, diabetes other than uh, change your lifestyle. Do not have these glucose peaks, but have 10 meals a day. Take some medicine to help the glucose area. There are, maybe, you know, there are two types of diabetes. Uh, if you take sugar or, or any food that has sugar, uh, 
it's all transferred into glucose. And the transform is done by insulin. So we have a gland that makes insulin. And some people cannot make insulin, so they have a problem. You eat foods and you have an immense peak because the sugar is not processed. Well, these people can easily be helped because you give them insulin. So they take injections and they're perfectly fine. That's called diabetes 1. No problem. But diabetes 2, that means your cells do not understand the glucose anymore. So no matter how much insulin you give, the cells don't eat it. So uh, they only eat it very slowly. And then you have a real problem, and that's diabetes 2. And diabetes 2 is now exploding worldwide in an immense way. And in China, they have 11.6% is now people have diabetes. And that means there's a lot of yeah, damage occurring, and they should know this as soon as possible. So we started an early vision with early warning system. And I heard from the Lena that it's actually worldwide, and even in Romania, there's also quite a spread of uh, diabetes. It's in the United States. It, it's everywhere. So uh, you need to find the small bleedings, the changes in these vessels, because they get weaker and they get more, more sloppy. You take these images with what's called a fundus camera. Actually quite simple. Your eye is plus 43. It's a pretty, pretty strong lens. So if you put a minus 43 lens in front of it, you can look directly inside. And you need the flesh, because it's very dark inside. And the light that comes back, you just take a picture with a normal Canon or, or Nikon or whatever camera, and you get a digital picture. So that's every hospital, every optometrist, etc., has cameras like this. So worldwide, we see now this incredible increase in diabetes, and in Asia, it's even worse, because they have a genetic component as well. Mm -hmm. So they have a lifestyle problem, <coughs> they didn't have sugar let's say 20 years ago, and now it's sugar everywhere. And I did some investigations on how much diabetes was there. And in 1980, there was no diabetes in China. And then in 1985, 1.8%. And here, and now today, we have here 11.6%. And there is no way leveling off. So maybe it, it just goes on. It is quite spectacular. So the government is panicking. Uh, it is too much healthcare costs, and the problem is that you have leakage everywhere, but the retina is quite special. The retina is the most oxygen-using tissue in your body. It even has three layers of blood vessels, in the middle, on top, and on the bottom. So if something goes wrong with the blood supply, because the leakage, it's the first tissue that really damages. And then the damage is pretty strong, because you get blind. So this whole program that we set up together with the Chinese uh, government was a blindness prevention program to see the very early beginning of damage. And that's what we're going to do. We tell people, hey, you should change your lifestyle. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't eat sugar. We say, come on. People don't go there. Especially you, we, we didn't have this for 20 years and you already have a long time. Let us now enjoy. And I, I really don't go do it. And then you tell him, you show him the small microbeads, he's incredibly warmed. He knows that he gets blind, and that's the best way to inform people, hey, it's really about you. Uh, you are the only one who can take measures. So it works. And we have done so far already thousands of people, and the goal is to scan uh, 24 million people. It's the elder half of one province in China. And if that's going to work, we go further. It has now become a company. Retina check. Uh, I'm talking with Elena to make a Romanian branch of Retina check. Uh, the Chinese investor has bought the software from TOE. They will enroll it out now in China. I'm going to tell you a little bit what is in this software. So it's quite a big project. I'm leading 25 people, and these were PhD students. And over the last uh, uh, couple of years, uh, we had a lot of uh, output, we had students on this, and we split the work in work at TOE on the mathematics. In China, they did the e-cloud, we collaborated with hospitals, and in China, we had a whole hospital with uh, diabetes patients. And over the last four years, we wrote about 55 papers on, on this project, so there was uh, quite a lot. So what did we do? 
we measure the vessels, the bleedings, and if you have the bleedings, the body is, of course, very clever. It removes blood. It cleans it. Uh, but it doesn't clean it completely. It can take the blood away, but the fatty tissue remains. So you, you keep some fatty deposits, and also though those make you blind. So what we did is uh, a whole set of measurements. First, find the vessels. Find these microaneurysms, these very tiny bleedings. And this is the key point. As soon as you show, if you see those, you know you have diabetes, even if you see one. And doctors can hardly see them. It takes a long time to see them. And if you have 24 million of those, it's quite a lot of work. So we need to keep learning. If you have vessels, they are normally straight. They go directly to the target. And they bring the sugar and the food and that thing directly right there. And you go the shortest path. It's a straight way. But if the vessels get weaker due to the diabetes, they get sloppy. And you can measure the curvature. And the curvature is actually in every point you have a curvature, a positive curvature, a negative <coughs> curvature, a zero curvature, that's great. So we also, and people cannot see the curvature. You can see, okay, this is curved, but how much? Is it, is it really, you cannot give numbers to that. And the angles are normally 90 degrees. You go directly to that point. So if it gets sloppy, all these branching angles also get different. So we measure everything. The whole thing was, uh, and we put these, what we call these biomarkers, we put those now in the deep learning system. So we're not learning pixels, but we're learning more fancy extracted uh, properties from the earth. We looked at the fractal dimension, we looked at the branching points, and the branching points you can use, of course, to stitch the images together, because you want to scan the whole retina, we measure the angles, you want to find the properties for the arteries and for the veins. So for a few minutes, not so easy, but for the computer, also not so easy. What is an artery bringing the oxygen? And what is a vein and taking the CO2? They differ in color, but they also differ in shape, they differ in reflectivity. But we could nicely find the arteries and the veins. So measuring all these properties, we said, well, we do not only look at diabetes, but we can make a one-stop shop. And diabetes turns out to be related with this, artery width, vein width, tortuosity, that, that's the curvature. Glaucoma, that's a high eye pressure, it's another disease, was related to those. Cardiovascular diseases. So if you measure all of them, you can give a probability that, hey, you might have the beginning of glaucoma or you are in a diabetic phase. So this is the one-stop shop idea. If you take a picture, do multiple diagnoses on this, on this picture. So we signed contracts. It was quite a big project. I get several millions of uh, grants from the European Union, uh, from the Chinese government. Um, this is the Minister of Healthcare. This is the ambassador in Beijing. We have a company making cameras. This is the CEO. This is the head of the, uh, we collaborated with a big group of hospitals in China. It was a group of 11 hospitals. And this is a big shot. He's leading 1,200 people, all employed by him, uh, doing eye care. So that was uh, quite special. And we were very good friends, we, we, we know each other very well. And I was the, the MD biomedical engineer combination. That's exactly what you see here. It's a super combination, and I really urge you to find a good clinician, team up with him, and you both make a super career. It's, it's what I see my people do, do too. So, the uh, software that we wrote did a lot of, uh, yeah, in this case, tracking of vessels, even if they were very close, we managed, we could find these very tiny uh, microaneurysms, and here you see the findings, and the intensity of the circle gives the probability. So the higher the intensity, the, the most probable it is. And we were pretty good, and actually that was really nice. We were better than the doctor, and that was the breaking point. Then we said, okay, we're not only faster, cheaper, 24 hours a day, but also better. 
time. That's 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 the that's the big thing of these learning models. That's that's why people want it. But you need to train it with a lot of data. So it took us forever to get the data out and to uh, study this. But now once you have then the network, then you can set up your eCloud system. And I'll show you later that uh, to upload it, you do the inference, you put it through your network, and you send it to the WeChat application to the customer. He pays a small amount of money, and yeah, you do this for a million people. That, that's actually the, the business model. So we built the whole pipeline, and as I said before, we have 55 publications over the last five years, or four years, on all this. Uh, four piece instruments, one from Laude. And they did all these, uh, 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 as I said, curvature junction detection. Uh, this is R3 vein, so you see the red uh, uh, blue. A lot of these measurements. How did we use these? Um, it's a brain-inspired methods. Well, first of all, we used this uh, center surround method. So we said, let's do this background normalization. And you see the images that are dark here and bright there. You make them now completely homogeneous. That's the first stage that's our <coughs> retina doing too. So we did it and you see that it nicely cleans up. Then we said, hey, we have all these orientation filters in these pinwheels. So we said, okay, let's stick in one pixel, and I'm going to look around with my uh, with my filter. <coughs> sorry, and I go make a complete scan, 360 degrees. And if I'm standing on the vessel, I have a lot of output in the direction of the vessel, but almost nothing if I go into the background. And if I go the other way, I have a lot of output. How do I enhance this? Well, you take a non-linear operation. For example, you take the square. If this output is 10, you make it 100. But if this output is 1 tenth, it becomes 100. So then the difference is 10 to the fourth. So this non-linear operation on this orientation score was wonderful. And even if there are branches, then you have just three outputs. It also it, it always worked. So this pretty noisy image, because this was not a regular image, we worked with advanced cameras. This was a laser scanner. And this was green light. 531 nanometers. That's exactly the absorption of hemoglobin. So the tiniest small bleeding you can see that gives a high contrast because it was a green laser that was the company we worked with. But it was pretty noisy, but because of this orientation filters, we could clean them up. And here you see how nicely we clean and elevated surface and we completely reduce the background noise. Having all these rotational things, and you count, for example, how many maxima you have. Stand, suppose you stand on the vessel, you have two maxima. But suppose you stand on the branching point here, you get three maxima if you rotate all around. And it's extremely simple, you just count, and it's very easy. All the yellow points are the points where you find three maxima. So you have a T-junction. That's, uh, no, it's, yeah, it's not a T-junction, it's, it, it, it's called a bifurcation. This is a 2D image. And if you count four uh, maxima, you have a crossing, the red ones. So these are beautiful landmarks, and we find hundreds of them in a millisecond. It goes really fast. This is a very simple processing. So we use them to stitch images. We ask the patient to look at the small array, nice points, and you get now the whole retina sample. So then we measured the curvature, and it was pretty difficult to measure the curvature. But what if I had these two roots, and he also was a very, very bright one. He said, if you have an image like this, we should measure in every point the curvature. And what is the curvature? Well, here you see the curvature goes like this, and here the curvature goes the other way. This is called convex, this is concave. The curvature in this point is actually one over the radius of the touching circle. So it is a very tiny circle. I have R is very small, 1 over R is very big. If I have a straight line, the touching circle is huge. So R is very big, 1 over R is 0. So the straight line has 0 curvature. And you have positive curvature and you have negative curvature. This is convex, this is concave. So every center line has a curvature. 
So he has thousands of curvature points. So what did we do? We fitted in this multi-orientation pinwheel structures, we fitted circles and that worked fantastic. So we have now all the curvature here, straight is blue and highly curved is in yellow or red. And because we have all these points, we put them in a histogram. And in a healthy retina, all the vessels are straight, you only have zero curvature, so all the points in this histogram are in the middle. That means you have a very narrow histogram. And if you're ill, you get a broader histogram. And here you see that the healthy ones have small curvature, and the diabetic retinopathy have high curvature. This was a very sensitive measure for do you have the beginning of illness. And even before people reported, yes, I have diabetes, we could already change the, see the changes in the curve. So it's, 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 it's very specific. We designed a whole workstation. This was my postdoc. You select the patient, you, you build up all kinds of tasks, and you have an automatic report generator. And the project was called Retina Check. We did this in Shenyang. That's a pretty big city in China. It's now more than 10 million people. And Philips happened to be there because they did a joint venture with uh, the biggest medical imaging industry in China, Nusso. So that's the reason why we built a separate sister school from my university. We went to the hospital, and it was actually a 3,000 bed hospital. It was quite nice. And I talked to the doctors. And the reports had to be translated. It was, of course, Chinese. We tried to tap data from the hospital. Not easy. Everything is in Chinese, so I really needed Chinese students and Google Translate, you name it, but it, it worked. And in China, you cannot directly collaborate with someone. You first need to get to know each other, the dinner, another speech, another stand-up. It takes a long time. And once you trust each other, then you can talk business. You can say, OK, I'd like to do this together with you. So that was a fascinating time, but it all worked. And we managed to get a complete room in the diabetes department. This is our camera. Uh, this is the laser camera, this is the normal camera. The patients have a kind of, uh, you have what is it, a jail jacket. <laughs> These are the patients there. Uh, and we scanned about uh, 20 to 30, 30 patients every day. I paid for the operator, and every patient that came to the diabetes department, and it was a big department, we have 20 to 30 new patients every day, and we scanned them immediately. We connected to the hospital information system, so we also knew the blood values, and urine samples and, and everything, so we could, we knew how much diabetes did they have, and can we correlate this to all the findings that we did, how much curvature is related to how much diabetes. Because if you measure 17 biomarkers, that's ridiculous, too much, so we, we have, have to find a little bit which, which is the, the real one. Well, we did more than 4,000 patients, a lot of work. Uh, and now it's going to explode. Professor Kerr has now acquired four buses even that can go to the rural areas that fill with cameras. He has shops where he sells glasses. So if you go for a pair of spectacles, you sit in this uh, bar and they measure your eye, how strong is it, what lens shall we give you. And then the operator I shall also take a picture of your retina. Why? And then she explains, uh, yeah, because we need to see if you may have the beginning of damage due to diabetes, maybe you don't know. And for a very low price, they take a picture, and we gave them advice. And if we see some small things, go to a doctor and check. So that's the whole idea. And in 60 of these shops, we have no cameras. So it's, it's, it's really beginning. There's only one city. And if this is going to be a, a success, and the rest of this year, that, that should turn out to. Then we uh, go much more further. We had such 50 patient shops, it's already uh, 60. And then we go to 110 healthcare centers and these four buses, so it's going to be bigger. Um, this is the setting you have in all these shops. This camera, you see me here with my students. You also have now the developments that you have retina cameras that fit on the smartphone. They're really tiny. And I like to find a company who makes them for very small money, let's say five euros or so, 
and I can send them to all the diabetes patients at home. And they just make a picture. They upload the picture. They pay by electronic banking. And they get the service back. Because that's actually the, the business idea. And this can be done anywhere. This can be done in Romania. This can be done in the Netherlands. This can be done in China. And that's exactly what we want to roll out. And I'm talking deeply with uh, Lina. She already booked the site uh, written at shape.ro. So uh, maybe we can uh, finally uh, set up the largest umbrella like thing. Um, we designed in China a WeChat application. So after taking the image, we can send the image back to the person who paid. And he sees the report, he gets the advice. Uh, and for the hospital, it's nice because if something is wrong, he goes to the hospital and he becomes a paying customer. And then the income for the hospital begins. So it's a, it's a low cost early warning and we found that many people are highly interested but too many people just don't know yet. So we also need a lot of publicity campaigns that say, hey, for little money helped by deep learning, you can get this early check and it is an early warning system. So, of course we did uh, deep learning, uh, I showed you this, and there was a challenge by Kegel. 2015 and Kegel, you should have a look, Kegel.com. It's a Canadian company and they organize these games, these challenges. And they give big prizes. And this prize was $100,000. And they made available 90,000 retina images. 30,000 were given, what was the diagnosis, and 60,000 was, uh, yeah, see how much you can classify. So we built a deep learning system, and we also could compete it. Uh, there were 661 teams, it's amazing, because everybody could use the data, they had these TensorFlow, and they were working on it, and it was fascinating. The world exploded because of these challenges, because you could have data. And we ended up at place 17. It's not, it's not too bad, that's, that's the top 2.6%, so we were pretty happy. But the winners had to give their code so we learned a lot from these winners, and uh, they were looking at specific networks, so everybody downloaded these networks, and the field exploded because there was so much knowledge. So all these networks, and today you have an amazing amount of networks, and we looked at residual networks, and they turned out to be extremely good. Residual networks do something special. They do a whole processing pipeline, convolutions, pooling, Convolutions, etc. But they compare the processed data with the original data. So again, the natural way of working in a neural network is look only at differences. So here you see this network only looks at differences. You have a small processing step, look at the difference. So this small, let's say small difference detector, you put a lot of them together. And we, we put about 17 behind them together and we had a residual network. And that turned out to work really nice in such a way that this is the output. And per pixel, we could say where is a fatty deposit and where is it normal. And normally, you have to ask the doctor, indicate where is the disease. You have to do what's called annotation. It takes forever. But in this case, we didn't need to do it. We only could say the image to the network, there is some pathology. We don't know where, but in this image is something wrong. So we give it image-based, the output was pixel-based, and that was spectacular. So we found all these uh, extra dates, and the sensitivity was amazing, 99% good. And this is just quite so better than, than doctors for this extra day detection. So the doctors were amazed, we were amazed, it works extremely well. So we have a very good start from the, the whole thing. So, computer-aided diagnosis finally works. Uh, I think I will stop here. This is my last slide or something. Yeah, I have some conclusions at the end. Um, we have now the big data. We have the GPU parallel processing power. We get more and more clever algorithms. And I think there's still a lot to learn as I told you today by looking at this energy-saving guy. And I call it vision for vision, that means learning from vision, 
to prevent blindness, to help vision. So it's a little bit of a yeah, philosophy that the, the brain can be studied to help the diagnosis. So all these measurements from the retina, etc., they now go into a, a big program. It's called Vision 2020 from the World Health Organization. And this was all done by my retina check team. I've now retired. The company is now being formed and being taken over by the Chinese investors. And he's now hiring new people. There's a lot of Chinese people, but he's probably setting out an umbrella for getting more companies involved. So I'm very happy to see that this now finally lands into healthcare. And it finally works. We have deep learning, and it is fascinating to see that it is so at such a scale can we do a blindness prevention. So I stopped here, my last slide, I think. Yeah, I gave a course uh, every year in, uh, in November, and I talk 24 lectures about this, but it's in the Netherlands. Uh, but this course is also on video. I take the last year on video so you can have a look. And most important, in September, we have the, uh, uh, as, as Elena just said, we have the uh, SSIMA summer school. I'll be back and we invite many more people like me. And we look at deep learning from all different uh, uh, cases. We have medical people, we have, uh, I talk a little bit about the brain uh, stuff, but we have much more. We have very good teachers who, who talk about uh, Python, and, and uh, so it will be uh, yeah, a state-of-the-art course with state-of-the-art lectures, and we get quite some uh, famous people. It's really nice. We already get them for several years. We are very uh, highly respected by the community, so it's right here in Bucharest. So enjoy it. It starts 16 September for a whole week. Keep an eye on it. Thank you very much. I will make available the stuff that I presented. Uh, there is a website, uh, frontendvision.net. And I have also the exercises I like to do with you, but do them at home. Uh, you can download them from the net. These are not bad and notebooks. And play. That's, that's, that's the right advice that people to do. Are there any questions? <coughs> we all go to. Yeah, I've got one question. Please so done your work with Philips in the industry. I mean, uh, working, creating, or optimizing the software for Philips in order to do it for the medical care. I mean, so that, that the diagnosis will be integrated in the system. <laughs> Philip is a great player in the field, and Philip is next door to my industry. Yeah, that's why I'm asking because I are in uh, Eindhoven as well, and yes. I have a as well. The I have a lot of the students regularly with me, and I think half of them did the project together with Philip as well. So they bicycle back and forth. So I'm very, very close to collaborating with the students. They give me data, we get them students. These students stay in the laboratories, and if they're good, Philip's <coughs> all going to uh, it's a very nice program. So in what areas have you done any work with them? I mean, you told us about diabetes. Have you done any other works in diagnostics or is it just... Uh, I'm not being that? honest, but yes, I have 42 years of experience in uh, breast cancer detection, in brain collectivity. No, okay. it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. So it works in every field, in every area of Not medicine. every area, but the, the major areas. The major areas are CT and MRI. You have a couple of big diseases. Uh, people smoke, then force of people. So lung cancer is a big issue. So we did a lot of lung cancer detection. Well, especially um, in China. <laughs> no. I'll show you a um, website. Actually, that's a nice example. I had quite a number of very nice uh, uh, PhD students. It's called cat 4 tb And he just sent me an email here. Dove Imaging Center. Um, oh, from uh, no, this is from a company that's called Delft Imaging Center, okay. the Delft Imaging System. And I had several cum laude PhDs. And this guy is Bram Beginneke. He brought the software 
computer aided diagnosis for tuberculosis. And we started together to do this. And this guy started to come to me. He's now the head of the group in Nijmegen. He's a professor himself. He has uh, more than 30 PhD students. It's quite a famous guy. And I'm very proud of my pupil. Uh, and this is what the program does. It automatically finds the area where there is tuberculosis detection. <laughs> and tuberculosis is mostly in Africa. So he works together with a company that makes mobile X-ray trucks. And they have now uh, more than 160 trucks in operation. And his deep learning software is in working in all these areas. And in Africa, we have now a lot of activity there uh, setting this out. So, um, so the mobile center for breast infection in the Netherlands are also made by that or not? Because I know about that. They also made by that. They, they also made by that and they are using that uh, deep learning as diagnostics? Right. I have uh, uh, another student who started the company, Tirona. Okay. And Tirona is doing all the breast cancer detection. Yeah. And you have to go with that because, because you have this campaign which is free for women, uh, for women in, uh, in the Netherlands. They started about, I think, more than. I think about 12 years ago, yeah, something like that. people realized that if you find a tumor early in the breast, it's still small, you can easily operate it. And yeah, how do you find it? Uh, that's, that's difficult. And it turns out that early finding was so effective and saving so much quality of life. And, and let's say that, that you can, if you go to the doctor and you, you feel something, and it's too late, it, it should be really small. So they started a screening program, and every woman in the Netherlands can yeah. call, get a letter from the doctor, from, please come to the hospital, it's for free. And every two years, uh, we advise you, come to the hospital and make, take a picture of both of your breasts. And it's all done now by screening, because there are billions of women who do that. And this screening program is very cost effective. Because it is so preventive. Yeah, this is why I'm asking because I know about the, its cost effectiveness. Yeah, this is why I'm asking. Okay. And Thanks. there are actually a couple of tumors that are. Uh, there are four major diseases. Uh, diabetes is one, but you have breast cancer, lung cancer, and prostate cancer. Oh, okay. And also for the prostate, that's the most occurring cancer for men. Mm -hmm. uh, we have now started a screening program for it because it is so often occurring. Oh, okay. And that, that's, that's a way of yeah, effectiveness in healthcare. But because the volumes, yeah, we need to assist with biomedical engineering technology and so on. It has to be automated. And it's so fantastic that we have now uh, deep learning arriving as it finally works. We struggled for years. 80, 85 percent good doctors said that's not good enough. We, we, we. So that's it. Finally, we have a tool we can trust. And in Africa, they, they, that's, that's even worse. Yeah? Hardly any regular. Yeah, well. So that's a different situation. Yeah. But that's right. Collaboration with industry is uh, very nice. Uh, we have a little bit of luxury in the Netherlands that we have this big guy. Philips is in the top three. You have Siemens, GE, and Philips. And then the whole bunch of smaller ones. We really hope to get Philips on board in SEMA, that they have uh, 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 that they support us, like they did for last year. Last year was a little bit commercial, wanted to be more technological with them. And we like to uh, see startups, people who say, hey, I believe in a little trick and I don't make my own company in this. Rent and check started actually from zero because the doctor asked, I don't know how to do this, there's so many people, can, uh, can you help? Can you write some software? And we said, yeah, that they will take quite some years, but yeah, let's go try it. So we went to the government, can you fund us some of these students? He said, yeah. Looks interesting. Let's 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 do it. So they gave me two big instruments. So you took the money from the government. For yeah, and then they asked for more money. I, I wrote to the European Diabetes Foundation. Oh yeah. They gave me two cameras for free. Uh, I asked the Chinese government, and they said, well, uh, yeah, we, we can support you because we have the problem that we can uh, pay for a PhD student, but he has to come back to China. Then I said, okay, pay for a okay. PhD yeah, student. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, one guy was from China and. His parents said, uh, wow, this is fantastic, but yeah, we, we have no funding, but we as parents paid for him. So he stayed four years in the Netherlands, paid by his parents. Wow. That was luxury, but that, that made it together quite a nice team, and that was actually... And then we had all these students from Biomedical Engineering, um, and it's... Uh, so, this is my...
my um, I just wrote the report, the final report of Resnetje. And here you see the final report of Resnetje. Uh, this is my National Science Foundation. And in the end, uh, I gave not only the publications, but all the master students. So, and three students were from Elena. They came to Eindhoven and they did the Erasmus project in my group. And you see automatic tracking and segmentation, resident micro surgery. So it was fun for the students to do small pieces of this project. And it was, yeah, because the data were there, it was highly motivating. Sometimes we went to the hospital and they fixed their own eye. Uh, eye doctors, uh, they found it nice. They, 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 they saw, hey, interested, in the, interested students, they, they were eager. They asked the students, what are you actually doing? What is this deep learning? We don't know. And the students gave them lessons. They were nice. <laughs> Still is nice. So you see that it is more than just doing research. It generates a new generation, internships. And all of this was, yeah, small pieces from a big puzzle. I had a lot of uh, joy with this project. I'm now retired. Yeah, Have you used for treatment to, or just analysis of neural networks? This is the first stage. You want to find the people who have the beginning of damage. And if you have very little damage, with a very nice treatment, change your lifestyle. Have the glucose level very stable and live healthy. Don't drink, move enough. And then you can get 100 years and the diabetes just stays stable. It doesn't progress. If you have very much damage, there are laser treatments and special uh, treatment, but in most cases, you may be too late and you will have uh, already some blind spots, they will never repair. So we like to prevent it, so be as early as possible. You have some treatment, but it's, it's unfortunately a little bit limited. Diabetes is not give a pill and you repair. That's, uh, that's, uh, it's another type of disease. I just have one more question now, have you used any other algorithms besides deep learning like, let's like say, causality correlations in order to determine the disease or something like that? Uh, no, we did not use that. We, we used uh, quite a number of deep learning networks, oh, okay. uh, specific so just that. Uh, but in the same sense, we didn't know exactly what to take, so we, we experimented with what others had done. We had this retina uh, gaggle challenge and 600 people did experiments, and the best ones were known. So we looked, of course, at those best ones, and from there we made variations. Oh, so you mentioned the, you didn't use the image per se, you used some features extracted from the image. Yeah. So presumably those were not convolution or convolution? No, because then you have more data, and uh, you actually do convolution because you put all these data in the feature vector. And instead of having pixels in the feature spectrum, you could have curvature values, or you could have branching values, or you could have AV rated spectrum. So things are topographically organized. They're topographically so it organized. makes sense to have convolution. Exactly. And actually, you do the same as humans, because humans do not only look at the image. Humans see the patient, and they know much more of the patient. They know that the patient is fat, <coughs> the patient is very old, or, or, or the patient is a kid. I mean, all these things are important for the patient has some, uh, uh, I don't know, kidney problem. So that has to be included in some way. And you can put it in your deep learning, uh, just like humans do. Actually, if you compare deep learning with humans, that's very, very sensible. If you want to know how much training do I need? 10 million, 500? If, if compare it with human, how quickly can a human recognize this pathology? Well, 500 images is enough. And it turns out that deep learning it does already quite a nice job. With these digits too, you don't need millions and millions. Of course, you get better, but if you compare it to humans, you always have good estimates of how should I begin. And that's always quite, quite interesting. OK, any other questions? Uh, uh, do you recommend any books for uh, uh, learning the mathematics of machine learning? Uh, there is so much that uh, that's difficult. There is, what I always do is uh, 
uh, if you take the most popular ones, so I normally go to Google Schooler and you look at the number of citations. And if the citation is really high, you know, everybody's doing this, and the first has a reason. They tell each other, hey, this is good, so well, that's always the good, the best recommendations. And there are so many books today that uh, look at how popular they are. And if you really are a beginner and you want to have some learning steps, this reading.com is at the very basic level because many people who go through their own learning process, they write about that learning process, hoping to help others. And these are very nice three to five minute reads tutorials. And it helps you really nice to zoom in and then you go deeper. But if you look on the internet, there are an amazing amount of uh, deep learning tutorials. Give you some of my students use, but look yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you have a question about the cat, uh, which you uh, see only the horizontal lines. Uh, the same thing is with the human uh, brain. So if you don't train your brain earlier on in the first three months, you, you will never. Is it reversible? Can you? Later on, train your brain to see the lines or these differences between all brains are permanent. The because sometimes you don't see the horizontal, sometimes I don't know, you don't see the ball or something, I don't know, what kind of black you know. <coughs> uh, I showed you the example of faces upside down. Exactly. You recognize, you don't recognize it because you have not the training for faces upside down. So can you play But people on? have done experiments with glasses that don't take the world. It takes about six weeks, and then you learn a whole new data set. You learn the whole world upside down. You can, you can work on it. But it, like, what you do is you train your network again with new features, but they are just rotated. And that, that takes about that, that time. But it turns out that the first three months of life, when you are born with a random network, they are pretty crucial. And uh, that more or less burns the first basic features. Uh, so the first three months of life are very, yeah, you burn 80% of it already in, and the rest is changes on top of that. So be careful with the first three months. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so the cat um, learned to discriminate vertical afterwards afterwards? Yeah, but it took a very long time because it is, it is mm -hmm. the, the plasticity is at call from the brain is highest in the first three months and later on it's still plastic but not as plastic as in these first three months. So it did learn but it took probably of years. Well, I'm afraid Google and Beetle, I, I don't call exactly, I, I think stereo vision you don't learn if you miss that. Uh, well, that's, that's exactly true. If you have the first three months, you blind one eye, and you need two eyes to see stereo vision. With two eyes, you make all the stereo filters. If you blind the first three months, you really don't see stereo the rest of your life. It, it, it's, it's pretty serious. So don't lock the eye of your job. OK, last question. I heard that the retinal tissue is very well oxy oxygenated. Uh, I'm asking the question about the smell. I read an article about how the strength of smell is somewhat similar with the way light receptor works. The smell receptor functions in a similar way with the light receptor. And I, I cannot ask you because I know nothing of smell. You, you should have a look at, at, at the literature. I cannot answer that way. There the may be some Detecting glaucoma. My answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. It was super to have you as an audience. And, uh,